for the artists, for the passionate. Welcome to the Adventures Elsewhere podcast. Hello everyone and welcome to the Adventures Elsewhere podcast, or welcome back if this is not your first time. I am your host, Jade Black, and today I'm continuing with my sub-series about writing different genres and sub-genres, and we are straying away from my usual territory, and we're going to talk about writing fantasy today, because I've I've done a fair bit of this in my time. Because this is a little more of a craft-based episode, I feel the need to say, I'm not here to give writing advice. I'm here to talk about my craft, my passion, what works for me, what I enjoy doing, all of that sort of stuff. That's the deal. So without further ado, let's get into this. So you'll have noticed me say, I'm sure at some point, I'm pretty open about this, that I'm not a fantasy fan. I'm not. I There are bits of fantasy I enjoy, so Alyssa Lovesang's Keeper's Trilogy is the most obvious example, and Poison and Opium, by the way, I'm super hyped for that. Um, The Legend of Zelda series, another really good example of fantasy I enjoy, but besides that, if I see fantasy on something, generally I'll put it away. (laughs) Like, yeah, okay, not interested anymore. But I do really enjoy writing it. (laughs) It's kind of the weird thing. I both love and hate writing fantasy, because I love the freedom of writing fantasy, but I also hate how much stuff I don't care for is kind of implicit in it. One thing I have found with writing fantasy as well is writing fantasy in first person I find quite difficult, as in, like, unnecessarily hard. When I've written fantasy, I've generally defaulted to third person, and on reflection, I think this is because of how much description is sort of needed for fantasy. Because you need to, you know, nobody in our world has actually seen, you know, this massive water spell work, so you need to describe some shit about that. And we know how I feel about descriptions on this podcast. We are, no thank you, I don't want to write descriptions. I'd, I'd just really rather not. In terms of fantasy I've written over the years, uh, it's more been about flash fiction. It's more been a flash and shorts thing for me for the most part. I did finish a fantasy novella. I did do a full first draft of one that I don't like the name I came up with it so I'm just going to call it Disaster Mel because my (laughs) main character's name was Mel and he is a disaster. But the one I want to talk about more is a project I never finished I think I probably got to about 10k and stopped. is Candidate 66 and this this is where the character on the bottom of the screen for those who are watching the accompanying video comes in. Because Candidate 66, I think, is a fantasy concept and everything I actually did pretty decently well. And for what it's worth, if you're looking at this character on this guy right here, this is my main character, this is Ling, and this is the, I guess, other main character, this is Caspian. But we'll get more into the detail of those projects a bit later on. So common elements I've noticed with fantasy in terms of what I've written and seen, but mostly more about writing. Descriptions. Descriptions are a big thing. I touched on this a bit earlier in terms of describing how the magic and all that nonsense works. Not just how the magic looks, but also if you talk about spell casting, potentially how that works, and if you've got like really high epic fantasy in terms of creatures and floating cities and sky whales and transport potentially and all those sorts of things. All of those things are going to need descriptions and 
Yeah, I mean, that is something that really puts me off writing fantasy, if nothing else. Betrayal always seems to be a thing that pops up in fantasy about... It's a bit of the protagonist's fight in the third act cliché. There is a bit of that. So I don't know whether this, you know, comes up a lot in good fantasy, but betrayal is something I've seen a lot of. And I think one of the most famous things in fantasy, again, is travel. I mean, Lord of the Rings, <laughs> obviously. But travel seems to come in quite a lot with fantasy anyway, just because a lot of it, I think, is about um, finding a lot of things or visiting sites of different magical power. Or There's a lot of stuff like that. And obviously the sites aren't all going to be in one place. And a lot of the time there is some self-indulgence from the author. And I'm not hating on this, by the way. I think it's perfectly reasonable to self-indulge a little bit with things about, oh, I just want someone to see this really cool location that I will build, about this, you know, this forest with purple trees and things. And yeah, that's cool. I probably do want to see that, actually. <laughs> I must feel dumb for mentioning this one, this common element, but, you know, magic as well, I think. There is a brand of fantasy that labels itself as fantasy without magic, but I don't know about that. I mean, I guess what they mean is alternate world plus, you know, creatures and strange natural phenomena. And I guess that counts, but I think it would be almost weird to have that setting without magic. But then again, I'm not a fantasy person. I I'm sure that's an example of it done well somewhere, honestly. If you know what it is, let me know in the comments. I would be genuinely curious about that. But yeah, magic comes up a lot. I'm going to talk about magic a more later on, and a lot of my gripes with magic and how I've handled magic systems in the past. The other really common thing I've seen in fantasy is high stakes, and I know there is, there has been a trend, I don't know that it's still a thing, of cosy fantasy and low stakes fantasy. At the moment it seems to have moved on to romantic fantasy, or romanticy as some people call it, but traditionally a lot of fantasy seems to have very high stakes about this magical artifact that can destroy the world and things like that, and I think that's kind of another thing that bored me about fantasy was it a lot of those things were kind of a deus ex machina or ended up being sold via a deus ex machina or look i can suddenly cast this spell on the power of friendship and just, just fuck off with that you can't expect me to take that seriously in anything above mg i'm sorry well actually i'm not sorry it's on you things i've noticed in terms of writing fantasy, and in this case it's things that I got wrong, particularly in Disaster Mel. Know thy map. You need to, preferably if you draw out your map, I think the preferable thing to do is to draw it to scale, or at least have some kind of scale or notes on how long it takes to go from here to there. A really famous example of this done badly is the later seasons of Game of Thrones. I mean, I didn't watch Game of Thrones, I will preface by saying this, but I know a lot of people who did. And they used to talk about how annoying it was, how in the early series it would take characters months to get from place to place, and then the later series it would be, hey, two episodes, and they're there! Or even just, you know, later in the same episode, and it's like, eh, hang on a minute, that's not how the map works. And this is something I did get wrong with Disaster Mel and paid more attention to in Candidate 66 as a result, was <laughs> the map was not consistent in terms of how long it took place people to get places, and I did try and justify this in terms of, okay, but they have this thing or that thing, but it just, it did not work. And <laughs> yeah, so making sure you know how long it takes for people to travel from place to place with something like travel being as a big a deal as it is in fantasy and even just knowing where things are and you know landforms i think play a big part as well about okay so this terrain is just really tough to traverse and how are we going to handle that 
that plays a role in fantasy that, again, this is something that I just got wrong and didn't think about enough. The other big thing I would say is know thy lore. Know how your magic system works. Know who's where. Know, know how the world works. And again, this is something I did. Didn't get quite so wrong with Disaster Mel, but there were places where I'm like, I don't think it would work like this. This doesn't really make sense. And, I mean, this is more of a consistency thing, and, like, granted, there are some magic systems that are kind of ruled by chaos or deities that play a hand and think, eh, actually, I'm going to balk this spell. And I think that could be really interesting to actually have a huge part of chaos feed into things, so long as you're open about that, or that's clear, or so long as that's clear to the reader and clearly communicated, I think that's fine. But if you're doing a fixed magic system, which is something that I tried to do, make sure you actually know what you're talking about. <laughs> And again, this is just coming from me kind of screwing things up and suddenly inventing powers because I couldn't think of a way of getting people out of things and then being like, okay, but if I wreck on that, then it breaks everything I've done thus far. And yeah, don't fall into that trap. <laughs> so seeing as I've done so much talk about magic, let's go into why I fucking hate it a lot of the time. Because the classic thing with like epic and high fantasy, I mean... Again, Lord of the Rings, good as example as any. You've got tons and tons of magic, but also swords and bows and axes, and you always get to the point, and you see this in a lot of fantasy games and D&D as well, is that actually if you have magic, you kind of just inherently trump everybody, and weapons are pointless, and... Okay, so why are the weapons even there in the first place then, and why is everybody so desperate to believe that weapons and that is the solution in terms of, you know, magical defences, and I know there are some fantasy novels that, you know, are a bit better about it than that, but in a lot of the certain types of games that I've stopped playing because it's so damn annoying, I don't necessarily want to learn as a gamer all of the con complex intricate natures of magic systems and how different magics combine and deck building and I don't necessarily want to do that and also particularly if it's a sort of real time battling and trying to find the time to do all that I don't especially if it's real time I don't want to do that actually I just want to play as the guy with a big sword or a big axe and hit things and have fun. But then, you know, some level 3 mage is suddenly a hundred times stronger than me. That's just really fucking annoying. I know it's really hard to make a magic system in a game that doesn't count for that doesn't break a little bit, at least in some way. It's really, really, really hard to avoid that. But it's very annoying to me if there's a clear mismatch of power there. And there are some games and series where it is genuinely an even match or sometimes the magic is actually less powerful and I like that too to show that actually magic is not the be all and end all and not always superior to everything because if the answer is always just oh magic and we don't have to explain because we can just suddenly do this thing if there are enough of us then it it reads like the power of friendship and it reads like deus ex machina and it reads like bullshit and you've lost me thanks one thing I think I did well in Candidate 66 is having a magic system that's almost entirely passive. And that was one of the ways I got around all of the stuff with spell casting. Because if I'm reading about a whole load of like spell casting and the intricacies of that and people chucking spells at each other, I'm not into that. So having a passive magic system that sometimes granted power and sometimes did things this way, but there was always like a really weird that you get this thing, but you also get this negative consequence that's often a bit left field. And that was something I really enjoyed 
playing with. And I think that was, for me, honestly, one of the highlights of Candidate 66. So um, I'm trying to think of a good example from that. So one of them was that um, my main character, Ling, could find these certain places a bit more easily, like he'd get some kind of soul resonance or something as he drew close to them, but the consequence of that was his tongue would bleed, and you know, if you bleed too much, that's, you know, that's death. <laughs> so, something like that as passive magic was really fun to play with. I think one of the other things to really bothers me about a lot of fantasy is the fucking pacing as well. And I think this is something that's genuinely really, really, really hard to get right in fantasy because, I mean, it's naturally somewhat slower paced. Well, I mean, it's actually a fair bit slower paced than a lot of thrillers, I would say, because thrillers are fast and fantasy is mm, medium, I guess. But it's really easy to get bogged down in a lot of description, you need a lot of description, and bogged down a lot of world building and magic systems, and you need that, but balancing actually keeping the pace going and the story going with doing all that is really hard. Because I know, I know this is controversial, I know a lot of people really love the Tolkien, let's interrupt the story for five pages of description. Yeah, no, you can fuck off with that. I'm not reading that. All I'm gonna do is skip those five pages and then if, well, if there's something important in that, well, fuck me, I guess. Oh well, I'm just gonna really badly lose interest. What I've always felt is good fantasy, and I, I know this is controversial, again, is when you can do that and provide everything I need and a good amount of description but keep the story going throughout it, that's a mark of good fantasy to me. And also, with all this excessive description, description, I want to use my imagination at least a bit, thanks. If you're telling me exactly how something looks and you're effectively telling me my imagination's wrong, I'm not going to be happy about that. And the other thing I've really struggled with with a lot of fantasy over the years is that the characters don't feel real, and I know a lot of fantasy can be very plot-driven, very heavily plotted. That seems to be in, in very, very common in fantasy circles that people are hardcore plotters, like proper hardcore. And what that often means in a more plot-driven genre is that the characters make the decision that favours the plot, and they don't actually make real naturalistic decisions, or it's almost like their personality and their agency kind of isn't there, because so much is put on the plot and the plot works like this, especially when magic is involved and you have to be this certain way in order to... Really, guys? <laughs> I don't know, a lot of fantasy is a lot of very thin character work. And again, there's a lot of good fantasy out there that actually has decent characters, and even character-driven fantasy out there. But it's not what I've seen a lot of. It's not what I've generally seen. And this is one thing that, you know, me being as character-driven as I am as a writer, that is something I did get right, for sure. So in terms of people to keep an eye on in fantasy, and this to me is, this is a point where I am a little thin on the ground. I will be honest about that. I would say the general public are people you need to keep an eye on, though. Because of how much they know about fantasy, how do they react to it, how much, you know, propaganda and all that is there around magic and different kinds of magic and deities, if they're involved and... I think there's a lot to be said for politics in fantasy is, and how much that plays into the general public. But I would argue just kind of everyone needs to be kept an eye on, but depending on how your magic system works, because if someone just suddenly develops a power, if that's a thing that could happen, then you're going to need to keep an eye on that person. And if anybody can just suddenly develop a power or find X things and you need to make sure you know where they are at all times, really, unless, um, 
you're a hardcore pantser sometimes and people just disappear and reappear and but then you're probably gonna end up with an editing headache <laughs> spoken from experience but yeah fantasy is a weird genre for me because it's in my eyes it's just so easy to get wrong is i think it's a very very hard genre to get right it's a very i think the pacing is one of the hardest things with fantasy and creating a magic system that there's an argument oh wait you don't need to understand my magic system i disagree with that personally and i think more passive magic would be nice to see that's something i'd really like to see in fantasy because reading about spells getting chucked around the shell i'm not interested <laughs> I'm, I'm really not so that's about the end of what i have for fantasy i think i don't know if i'm going to go into any particular fantasy sub genres i mean I can't see that happening particularly, but I don't know. I mean, this podcast never really has a plan. There are other genres outside of thriller I am going to touch on. So I would say if there's any particular episode you want to see, obviously you can let me know about that in the comments or on social media. That's cool. But if you, again, there's no schedule for all kinds of reasons and interview spontaneity is one of them the best way to make sure you don't miss an episode of a sub series like this really is just to subscribe there's no other way of putting it because then i mean you can go to your subscription tab and see that hey i've uploaded something i mean it's a wednesday so there's a new episode what is it oh it's part of the series and yeah stuff like that the other good way of making sure you know what i'm up to is to check out the home of the podcast on Instagram because on there you do get advance notice of what the episode for the week will be. So you can see if it's part of this sub-series or not and you'll also get soundbite teaser reels and other things as and when I experiment with them. So on Instagram I am jade underscore black 21. If you're interested in my writing and what that looks like for me and all of the talk I do about that, and my characters, because, you know, I talk about character-driven and pantsing and all that a lot. If you want to see that in action, that is Twitter. I'm jadeblack21 on there. Oh, I did allude to interview spontaneity and scheduling earlier, so let's talk a little bit more about that. If you are published or on the way, please do get in touch. I'd love to be part of your journey. You can the best way to do that really is via email. I'm jade42black at gmail.com. There is a list of things I want to know in the description. Please read that first so I don't have to give automatic no's if and when I get inundated. That's no good for anybody. Um, if you're indie or self-pub, you're the people I want to hear from the most. If you're shroud pub, that doesn't necessarily mean I won't talk to you. Worth noting, it doesn't have to be out yet. I'm happy to do things for pre-order. It doesn't have to be a new release either. It can be five years old, ten years old, whatever. I don't mind about that. It also doesn't have to be adult, just because I write adult, whatever. I mean, if someone wants to come in and talk about MG, I should be really interested to know more about the process behind that. Or, you know, if you're writing different genres, if you've got a really cool fantasy novel, bring it in, let's talk about it. I've talked about epic fantasy before on this podcast, so why not? That was, a, that was a really good time. Also, it doesn't have to be a novel. It can be a novella, it can be a short story collection, it could be poetry, whatever. Bring it in and let's see what we can figure out. But until next time, everyone, you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a like. It helps the channel a lot. Intro and outro music by me, copyright J Black 2024.